All right, today we're looking at uh, slave culture and society uh, in the South, uh, specifically looking at um, the structure of the plantation um, and that hierarchical structure that was there, along with how that um, really impacted uh, women uh, within the, the, the plantation mistress, as it's called, the wife of the plantation owner. Um, and, and then uh, poor white Southerners, which had a very different lifestyle uh, in the South than the plantation elite. And then, of course, slaves, uh, slave, slave uh, society structure, um, the different types of slavery, uh, modes of resistance, um, and that type of thing, and autonomy that they had, um, or how they used and tried to maintain agency. So before we get right into that, just to re- uh, establish how this system got into place. Of course, the South had always been stronger with slavery um, than the North, but there were some changes that took place that um, expanded the South. We'll put, we'll put you um, Southern expansion. And cotton. And this is going to not only um, revitalize the slave structure and society and culture in the South, uh, it's also going to create a further divide between the South and the North. So um, one of the things that uh, transitions is that the South is going to shift shifts to... Uh, uh, Fully agricultural society. While the North, just to show the divide, the North moves towards industrialization, right? The market revolution, uh, wage labor. So you have two systems here with the industrialization, it's wage labor. And in the South, it's going to be slave labor and plantations. And so if you think of kind of the, the system and control, it's going to be like owners um, for wage labor. It's going to be owners of businesses that will become eventually CEOs. But at this point, are just, you know, owners of the factories and those type of things, the managers and then the workers for slave labor. It's going to be the plantation elite. Um, oh, well, let's. Put that because what this does create is if you're looking they had a very strict hierarchy in society all right so the, the first uh, would be the plantation male plantation owners that's important because it, there was a difference so the male plantation owners and then it would be the uh, wives of plantation owners and then you did have now this is a small group okay so you know I hesitate to put them in because they they were there but they they didn't play a role in shaping the society of the south and the culture of the south really at all because um, you, you did have some necessary groups, but it was such a small group. So I'm going to small number of, um, we'll call them the middling sort. And I know that's vague. These would have been people that had non-plantation jobs, uh, but still better off than poor white southerners okay so it, it's not like they didn't exist there were shop owners and there were others like that um and banks and and stuff that that they did have a role there that that were decently wealthy enough to not be lumped in with the poor white southerners but they don't shape the culture at all okay and they really aren't um in it the way that the poor white southerners and slaves were uh, so they're, they're kind of, I'm, I'm going to put it like this because they're kind of like, they're there, but they're in this, their own little thing. Okay. And then it would have been the poor white male Southerners 
and then of course the poor white female southerners women southerners poor white women and then slaves um and and there's a small uh free black population too um but not much but the, it gets less and less as we move closer to the civil war because of this dichotomy because of the tensions uh it was dangerous to be uh, a a freedman or a free black southerner because you could often get uh kidnapped and forcibly put into slavery even if you've never been uh, you could be accused of running away. Your rights were extremely limited. Um, so again, they were there, but minor compared to the slave side. If we're looking at the culture, um, it's, it's really the one, two, four, five, and six in that sense. Okay, so this is what gets established in this hierarchy. And part of the reason that it does is because society gets dependent, becomes dependent in the South on slave labor uh and this of uh, this is what creates then a slave society and culture right because there's two things you have a society with slaves and then a slave society society with slaves is what the north had been and still was in some areas that they were a society that had some slaves um and i mean if you look throughout the world that's usually how it was is there were societies that had slaves the South became a slave society, meaning that their entire culture, politics, so what this means, I'll write that down because it's important, politics, culture, and economics all dictated by uh, institution of slavery. It really was dominated on this. And they saw the North um, as a threat to this, to their society. And this is, of course, where some of the tensions um, are going to emerge that are going to create further polarization that eventually lead <clears throat> to the Civil War. I mean, it, it, there are so many things going on with that, but that's part of it, is there's this constant dichotomy and tension between the two, and ultimately the this, um, you know, the North has, was threatening their way of life. Um, there it w is a good source, and I'll have to, I don't think it's in the new version of Voices of Freedom, unfortunately, I'll have to double check, um, but what it talked about was writing, and basically it was a defense of the southern culture and structure <clears throat> sorry and it they write it and say you know you claim you know, our society is is bad but wage labor is the true enemy and that's that's one of the things is that they target is they they call you know wage labor as you know evil and destructive Of course, this is all coming with a very racist bent because they're focusing on only white people. And 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 then there's another component to it, which we're going to see <clears throat> a lot, um, which is paternalism. From this, you get pater is father in Latin. And essentially, paternalism is this idea that, you know, that you, um, uh, a loving father, a father that is... Um, that you have fatherly feelings, essentially that you are responsible for someone. What, what it really boils down to, we saw this in the market revolution with the low mills and the girls. Paternalism is for this feeling of obligation to look after someone because they can't look after themselves. And it's supposed to be in like a, a, a parental way. Now, that's fine for children because they need that. But when you then apply it to adults, whether it be um, <clears throat> slaves, of the free black population, women it becomes some um, super condescending and controlling and paternalism in this sense was that, you know, we're the argument with this. And was not only that wage in this, this source um, was that you know, wage labor is evil. The North, look, the people are hungry. They're starving. Um, how do you see that as a good society? Um, and then, you know, he said, we in the South, 
you know, we take care of our slaves, we look after them, they're well fed and clothed, which of course, I mean, that was uh, not accurate in, in all regards. Um, <clears throat> you, you, it, it was completely dependent. So your uh, experience as a slave was entirely dependent upon um, the individual uh, home that you lived in and forced to work. Um, there were some some uh, similarities that you could say were more universal, but how many, how much clothing you had, how much food you got, how long you worked, how harsh the punishments were, really depended upon each and every different one. So there were some that were uh, obviously less; uh, they didn't uh, do as harsh punishments or uh, made sure that they were clothed more. Nonetheless, of course, it's always still slavery, and 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 you're not free. And it's still looking at on the lens of of, of uh, superiority based on white uh, versus black, and and also of course just dehumanizing them as as people. But <clears throat> the argument was, we clothe them well, we feed them well. They <laughs> then the, this is the worst part of it, that that I mean, and just this was truly believed by some. So we know that this one, this again, sorry, I'm interrupting this part. It is propaganda. They definitely are promoting this idea. And some people truly didn't believe this, and or, or at least recognize the hypocrisy in it. But we know that there were other slave owners that truly believed this, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you another story after this. So what happens with this is that they say, you know, we we take care of them, and you know, look, they don't want for jobs; they all have jobs, and you're like, uh, forced jobs that you don't get paid for or able to support your family with. But you know, hey, they're not you guys in the north have homeless people and people who who don't get paid anything and are starving we in the south we have job people have jobs uh whether they want them or not they have jobs we give them clothes and food so they're not starving we look after them when they're older which wasn't always true either uh some yes some no uh it, it went on to suggest you know that that they there's no there's very little crime and we look after if some poor beggar or hungry individual was walking around, we would invite him in and give him food and, and help him out. Of course, if they were white, um, they don't say that, but that's the, the obviously uh, what's going on there. But so the point was that they were comparison and saying, this is what the evils of industrialization. And this is why the plantation system and, and Southern society is so much better. Um, the thing of how we know that some people really truly believe this wasn't just all propaganda because they definitely were pushing back against the abolition movement uh, with this uh, source when they were writing. Um, and so it, it was meant to, to try to counter abolition arguments. But we know that they truly believe some did believe this because um, there's letters that were written after during the Civil War and, and right after the war with the Emancipation Proclamation where a former slave owner she wrote um to us one of her former slaves that had run away and wrote him and said i don't understand why you ran away you know we always took good care of you why would you leave please come back <laughs> and so you know it's just obviously she believed that paternalistic structure that you know if we take good care of them we're providing for them they aren't going to be able to survive on their own and and this gets applied to slaves. It gets applied to women as as well, quite a bit. We saw it with low mills, and it, it it definitely is applied to the wives of the plantation owners as well. The paternalism part. So that's a huge part within this the society. Now, how it becomes uh, dependent upon slave labor um, is of course cotton. And um, what happens are um, some new developments. One was the cotton gin. And the second was what was called short staple cotton. The t these two things um, reopened and reinvigorated um, plantation structure in the South because what it allowed the cotton gin allowed for um, you know the machine to process the cotton, which you had to do by hand before it took a long time. Because of the new technology, it allowed for a different type of cotton called short staple cotton. So from the cotton gin, it allowed the short staple cotton. And the short staple cotton was coarser. It was also hardier. So this opens up the southwest. And uh, it, it allows for more land and profit. Prior to the cotton gin, 
uh, slavery actually looked to be dying out on its own. So, before cotton gin, slavery was dying out. And the reason it was it was it was dying out was because um the overuse of the land and um they didn't have there was a smaller profit margins. Okay. But with the cotton gin, it opened up this, like I said, this new short staple cotton, which allowed it to spread further, which allowed them to mass produce, which allowed for higher profits. And this is where you get the, um, because of the cotton gin, I can put another arrow here, cotton as king, right? This became like the go-to statement, cotton as king, because it was for the South. Cotton controlled everything. Um, and, and so it became, everything became wrapped around this plantation based structure producing cotton with, um, the plantation elite controlling, um, the culture, the politics and the economics of the South. So, uh, we're going to look at plantation society first, and then just work our way through the, down through the hierarchy of, of the different groups. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned um, before, uh, you had, um, the patriot, it was a, it was a paternalistic structure, um, dominated by, uh, this patriarchal system. Um, one of the things, so a patriarchal system, Patriarchy, it was in the North too. This wasn't, it's still, it's still around today. It wasn't something new or, or anything like that. The, the, what happened is that the Southern system of plantation structure uh, reinforced and, and certainly uh, kept it together in this much stronger system that kept women from uh, expanding the way that the Northern women had um, and, and reinforced uh, a lot of it. So what you have is traditionally you have, um, this women are connected to the domestic sphere, right? Most of the time, if you look at women's roles, it can be connected to the domestic spheres and both the North and the South. This was true. All right, but women's domestic sphere in the South was dramatically different um, and had a, and certainly played a larger role in all aspects of their life um, and it played a huge role in in gender roles in society. So the, the idea was is that there wasn't in large plantations, There was, uh, was little distinction between, uh, home and, uh, public and private life. Right. They get merged together because, right. Your work for the men is the plantation and your home is the plantation. So in the North <clears throat> with wage labor, um, men went to work and the house was distinctly the domestic sphere. And consequently, while this did make women's work invisible initially, they revitalized it to make it more valuable, uh, in certain ways where in the plantations you work in family, um, were, all together, it was both. And in the plantation system, uh, the man was head of the household. And in, in, in both, in both work and home, because they were the same thing, right? So what this meant is that women didn't have a strong 
separate domestic sphere to have control of. Okay. Um, it was, and it was, uh, it's proudly patriarchal and said and in fact they boasted on uh this system of patriarchy plantation uh the elite male plantation owners often um took pride in um protecting their honor and also the honor of their wives and families uh so much so uh that uh the southern plantation owner were often known for their willingness to uh resort to violence to avenge any perceived slight so willing to duel and fight for small perceived sl uh, slights To their name and the, even the idea of the name took on more uh, importance than in the north I mean even your name was important in the north too it was it was more so within this plantation elite what this meant is that uh, female deference to male authority was seen as a virtue And this is important because what it meant is that um, it limits your ability to have any political or social authority. Um, or social authority. And what I mean by this is that um, you you were supposed it, it was praised women were praised for deferring to their husband to being demure to being submissive so to stand up and protest your rights or suggest that you would like to do something independent was the opposite of then a virtue and frowned upon um it it severely limited uh southern women's ability to push for women's rights like what was going on in the north so because northern women did actually try to reach out to southern women the plantation elite when they were pushing for women's rights and say you know you're women too why sh you should be um joining us and for the southern women that that type of stepping out was against uh this this female deference to male authority um that they were supposed to have southern women uh the other thing is that that gets connected to this is southern women's identity gets connected to um, and defined by the contrast of, of slave women. So Southern women's identity gets uh, connected, contrasted to slave women. So what this meant is that uh, essentially um, women were elevated and idealized in the southern white women were elevated and idealized and put on this pedestal as this ideal virtue for their essentially the uh, contrasting to their lack of work and having to do anything compared to the labor of, of black slave women. Um, 
the, there was a statement from this that was well, when they were addressing it, which said the purity of white women rested on enslavement of Southern black population. Um, that again, this comparison of, of, of that, the, the purity and virtue of, of white Southern plantation women was that they didn't work, that they didn't have to do anything. Um, that they were there as almost a mere tool for the plantation owner. He controlled all aspects of that. He was responsible for his family and the work and, and controlled that. And you didn't question that. Um, so it, it's interesting because it made, like I said, it made when women were pushing for rights in the North, it made it in, un, un, incompatible um, with Southern women and this ideal of virtue and an expectation of patriarchy um, that existed. And of course, uh, one of the things that happens with this also is that when um, slavery ends, actually during the Civil War, before it even ends, during the Civil War, uh, many plantation women, uh, owners, uh, wives of the plantation owners didn't know what to do with themselves um, because of this. Um, and, you know, because they hadn't had to work because they, um, didn't know, um, you know, what they're supposed to do because that was also a stepping out is too far and they've had to find themselves having to actually do things to survive. Another good quote, uh, with this, uh, that, that gives you this idea is, is we behold the marked efficiency of slavery on the condition of women. We find her at once elevated, clothed, with all her charms mingling with and directing the society to which she belongs. No longer the slave, but the equal and idol of man. So that's, I'll put just the last part there. I'll read it again in just a second. But no longer the slave, but the equal and the idol of man. Okay, so the whole thing is we behold the marked efficiency of slavery on the conditions of women. We find her at once elevated, clothed with all her charms, mingling with and directing the society to which she belongs. No longer the slave, but the equal and idol of man. This, the, the Keegan, is what they're arguing is that slavery elevated women out of slavery. <laughs> slavery elevated white women out of slavery. Um, and, and, and that they are no longer having to do the drudgeries of women's work because slave women do that now. <clears throat> and they compare that to the North. They said, well, you know, you women, you still have to do all these things. Our women don't. They are now, you know, above that. And, and to, this is the thing with this, to, to have to, for, for plantation wives, it, you didn't work. And to work was seen as this abhorrent thing because, of course, it puts you back down closer to slavery. Why would you want to work? And or you know, look, oh no, so and so had to work. You know, things must be bad on on the plantation. It was a sign of 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 being poor. Um, it's just why they look down on poor white Southerners so much as well. Um, it was it was a sign of of that we you know we have moved beyond that we've been able to elevate white women out of the drudgeries of labor of course by on the backs of other women's labor um, but you know they didn't see that as as relevant in that process um, so the position and structure let's see we'll do B here women's lives on uh, as plantation wives and daughters um you know the the life um the the virtue of course that you have is that they were supposed to uh be um submissive To men. The other key thing that marked there is this life of leisure. Again, emphasizing that they have this leisure because of slavery. And um, that's what makes them better. That's what makes them elevated. Um, 
you're really the, what's key to this is not only leisure, but women's role was simply to be to be specifically eventually what that meant as a wife oops you you didn't have another role your role as a woman was to be a wife um but of course you didn't have to work as a wife um because you you didn't you didn't so there was you didn't have a job they were not taught um they were taught basic reading and writing and maybe a little history but not too much because you know they don't need a lot uh you're you're just there to be a wife you're not there to to go do other things the thing that was interesting about this is education in the south for the elite was by tutors you didn't uh no public education <laughs> They had public education for the poor, but it was really, really bad. So, again, women, actually women's educational level within this group varied drastically. You had some that were uh, educated by their fathers and it was they felt it was important to um, teach them and have them be well educated. And you had other fathers who did not want their wives and daughters educated and did not teach them. So it varied um, extensively within that, that process. Um, besides, um, basically all normal daily tasks were done by slaves. Women had a, a you had a personal slave, it was in the household, and they would, um, you know, dress you, wake you up. I guess I would go first, but whatever. Bathe you, do your hair, and, and so on. I mean, you literally kind of just sat there and didn't do anything. Both both boys and girls had their own personal slaves, but boys at a certain age were then expected to go out and actually start doing more of the the responsibilities and learnings of the plantation as well as a higher education. Um, so their involvement in the plantation life was significantly uh, more involved. Um, every daily care was taken by a personal slave. And then of course you didn't, did not cook because that was done by a slave. You did not clean. And in fact, um, motherhood so one of the things that um northern women uh centered on was motherhood and this idealized sense of motherhood and their responsibility women in the south didn't connect to this either because the reality was is while they gave birth <clears throat> they didn't raise their children very often um did not raise children because you had a slave for that as well. <clears throat> you had a wet nurse that would feed um, that would feed the child, right? A wet nurse is someone who was also pregnant uh, or gave well gave birth, and so um, she could breastfeed the a child as well. So you had a wet nurse, and then you had um, basically the personal slave that took care of their every needs. Many families had a very distant relationship. They weren't mothers. I mean, they were mothers in the sense of giving birth, but not in raising their children. And so the other thing that was interesting is when the Northern, you know, North came to them and said, hey, you know, we have this common bond. They're like, eh, not exactly. Um, actually, there was, uh, with the spinning bees, way back. Okay, so this just shows this this difference too. Way back with the Revolutionary War, with the spinning bees, right? Women were doing their own stuff. Well, in the South, with, with these plantations that were there, the women just had their slaves do it. I mean, so you didn't, they didn't do anything. And 
Oh, well, they did do one thing. Okay, so they didn't do much. Their job was to manage the household slaves. That was their job. But that involved usually managing one who managed everyone else. Your job was to manage the household slave. Your job was to have kids. So manage the household slave, have kids, be a wife. Um, which meant going to parties and leisure. And this was, this was, but it was boring. There were, there were some women that liked this. There was a lot of women, especially if they had been educated at all, that lamented. You couldn't in public society say, uh, I am so bored. This is horrible. I want to do something. Because again, that was anti this system that had been set up. Um, and, and so many women found themselves, you know, <clears throat> bored and uninterested in what was going on. They didn't have a good connection to their family. They didn't raise their children. They, they weren't allowed to do much. You had to have, um, that was nothing. You had to have a male escort, uh, in public. So you were limited on what you could go out and do. Um, you didn't have a lot of, you didn't have independent economic freedom in most things. The only thing that they did have, which was interesting, is that they did have dowry laws. Dowry laws are interesting because these are old things. Um, dowry was more connected to, well, in Mesopotamia had dowry laws in ancient civilizations, but it was connected to like in England aristocrats, so the nobility, right? This was often connected to nobility because, right, you were a noble by blood, by birth. Didn't You could be dirt poor and technically you were still nobility if you were born into that family. Most nobility had wealth because of how they managed to monopolize it, just like the plantation elite. But one of the things that dowries did is that they protected women because, the, of course, women didn't have skills. Um, they came from this certain lifestyle. The worst thing that could happen to you with as a father is to have your daughter become destitute after marriage and have to go to work. That was horrible. That was, that was not supposed to happen. So a dowry was a set of amount of money and goods that, um, a woman took into her marriage and the husband by law was not allowed to diminish the value of the dowry. That way, if your husband turned out to be a complete deadbeat, and you know everything you went for broke you still had some protection to make sure that you got to live the lifestyle you were expected to and so every family did now so what was this is the one property thing that women in the south got before women in the north even though women in the north were fighting for it was the right to own property the right to own and have inheritance that was entirely theirs that couldn't be transferred to their husbands. And it, so ironically, while the North pressed for this, the South got it. Now they got it for a very specific reason, which wasn't about women's rights or liberation or equal, you know, uh, responsibility, but rather we want to make sure that our daughters don't end up with a deadbeat or, or somehow go destitute and then have to, you know, become a poor white Southerner. So the dowry protects the women from those cases. And then they can pass it on to their daughters um, uh, when and when they die, like so for inheritance. That's their money to do what they want with. So it was the one, I guess you could say, thing that women in the South actually got that was a, a, um, in rights and and laws advanced beyond what the North had actually been pushing for stuff like this. So. Again, women weren't. They didn't do much. They were kind of there. You were to manage the household good, which which um, when reading. The Cruel Mistress um, by Angelina Grimke hopefully makes sense of some of this, of this uh, reaction of women and, and how they respond certainly entangles uh, some of these issues with the fact that they were there to be and didn't do and it's, it's devastatingly boring that with this, with the civil war, there were women, there were some women in that lamented their their fallen condition and, and becoming destitute and having to work to survive or be, uh, you know, uh, industrious. That was another word that was valued in the North, being industrious, not in the South. Um, but there were some women that, um, there was one quote that was basically, thank God we can go, go now have an excuse to go to work. Um, because, <clears throat> 
with the war and everyone becoming destitute, people weren't judging them anymore. And society was all about this of, of perception. Um, and so like I said, there was, again, there were, there were some women that were well-educated, um, but it probably only made it worse because then they found themselves more bored because there wasn't stuff for women to do other than to be. Um, and even with your children, you were only supposed to take a limited role in their upbringing. Um, because you know, you weren't supposed to have to do any of the work. That's the key. Anything that required any things like work, you weren't supposed to do. You were there to enjoy the fruits of their labor, the slave labor and the leisure that that provided, um, while being deferential to your husband and other men in society. Um, <clears throat> You were not to do anything else. Um, the other parts of society with, within the plantation system, uh, with um, the management, is is that you know men men managed essentially they kind of managed too. They didn't obviously oversee you. The men within the plantation system. Let's. Let's see here. Plantation system. Um, the plantation owners did not manage their fields themselves. You had overseers do that. Um, and the overseers were uh, usually the poor white southerners. Manage the fields directly. So they, you know, they were there for the, the economic for buying and purchasing slaves. But again, for the men, it was, it was, there was certain work of managing the plantation and working and dealing with other men in that system. But it was a lot of leisure in the process too. One of the things that was interesting with this is because the man was the head of the household and in charge of essentially he was the owner of his wife and children as well. Um, and the slaves is that you had um, what was common and certainly we talk about this within the, the perspective of the slave as well um, <clears throat> is that men slave owners often had sex with their slaves and had children This was um, one of those things where the women were aware of this. They weren't completely out of it. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't talked about. You didn't talk about it publicly. Um, you didn't acknowledge it in your household. Everyone whispered and gossiped. Gossip was such a huge thing on the plantation structures. You didn't whisper. You whispered and gossiped about who other husbands were clearly stepping out on them um all the while it might be clearly evident that your husband does as well but you don't mention it um so it was the uh well-known secret if you will in the sense that it wasn't a secret but everyone treated it like a secret <clears throat> some women uh plantation wives ignored um <clears throat> sorry their husbands actions while others would sell um, the slaves and children now not all women had that authority um, but if you connected to the household slaves they sometimes some of them did um, so some couldn't do anything about it some did that usually was vindictive um, because it was seen as a reminder of their husband's infidelity. 
Uh, what's interesting is that they actively went and talked about it with each other about whose husband was stepping out all the while pretending again that we there's you know their husband didn't so you had this this system um the other thing with it is this i mean this is connected to this when when the focus is on ownership of everything It, it meant that the, the man was really the head of the household in all senses of it. He technically owned everyone. And while different ownership for wives and children, um, it, depending on who your husband was, women often didn't have um, you know, any recourse if their husband was violent or abusive. And, and this did reinforce and encourage violence just as the plantation society plantation itself of what we'll say of slavery did so the, the plantation system reinforced violence it reinforced this absolute that's there this absolute control and the problem with absolute control is there is nothing to stop someone from doing what they want. And if this person isn't, uh, is any way vindictive with this person in any way, even if actually the reality is with the absolute control is it's problematic. I mean, if you have truly, truly have absolute control, it's easy to abuse that power. And you see it happen on the plantation system a lot to various groups of people. This is one of the reasons, too, you tend to see each group abuses people below them. So absolute control, abuse of power, and um, encourages, I don't know if it's encourages, or increases the likelihood of people abusing those below them. When you have no control with, let's say, so for example, the husband controls everything and abuses his power towards his wife. Wife has no control over that based on Southern plantation systems and society, but she does have control over two groups of people, the poor white Southerners and slaves, and therefore takes it out and abuses her power on them. Poor white Southerners have less control. They have no control over with the plantation elite that control their lives and can abuse them as they see fit. Therefore, they take it out on slaves because at least they're not a slave. And slaves, have, there is nothing after that as far as that control. That everything kind of trickles down. And abuse of power um, and lack of control leads to abuse. You see it, so like the even the poor white Southerners, the men would often abuse their wives because that they had control over. It's why overseers often were more brutal if they were from the poor wife Southern group because there was their power of control. They didn't have it in the rest of society, but they could enforce it and use it and show it over the slaves that they were managing. This is the problem with absolute control is it tends to lead to abuse of power. Um, not with everyone, but consistently and and this is the system of the plantation structure um and this like i said for women was especially difficult because of its it's it was suffocating in so many levels as far as the lack of what they could do so i think the cruel mistress also shows that and it's going to be one of angelina grimsky's arguments is that the whole plantation system is, is corrupt and evil because of this, because of this absolute control and because of viewing uh, slaves as subhuman, it corrupts. Absolute power absolutely corrupts as a statement. And it really is true. It's really hard for someone who has absolute power and control not to become corrupted in some way or another, or if they are within that system, not looking to where they do have control and abusing and abusing it there. Um, and, and that is one of, like I said, the arguments when you read The Cool Mistress, hopefully you see that. That's one of those components. Okay.
Let's look at the next group. One, three here. Poor white southerners. All right, poor white southerners. Um, again, you have the millionaire group, but we're going to skip over them because it was a small group and it wasn't really a massive part of the society. The reality was is that most white or most white southerners were not uh, plantation owners. Not plantation owners. In fact, <laughs> uh, like ten percent of the population controlled all aspects of the social, c cultural, and political structure of society. They were a small group. Uh, large plantations, let's say um, 50 or more slaves, were within that 10% group. The majority of Southerners owned a couple slaves to none. Um, so in the poor white Southerners, you did have a range. You had, um, we'll do that. So we, in, within the so poor white Southerners, you had those that were slave owners, and then those that were so poor that they were not slave owners. The majority were not slave owners. They couldn't afford a slave. Or if they did, they had one. You, it just, they didn't have the money to do so. These were small-time farmers that owned their own land and farmed for themselves. Mostly sustenance-based farming. So sustenance-based farming, right, is farming for survival, just to uh, survive. These were usually called, the term that you see for them is... Uh, Yeoman. Yeoman. <laughs> Oops, not mim. Min. So the yeoman farmer. Okay. They rarely moved up in social status and they were very aware that their position was going to remain static. Um, you. The reality is that while technically... B. While technically a, a class system... the south was more of a caste system of course for slaves it was never a class system but <clears throat> it really was um more of a caste system and the difference between caste and class class is based on economics and you can move up and down a caste system you're born into your position really in the south it was way more of a caste system unofficially um, because the the white poor white farmer, like I said, didn't have economic opportunities to move up, and they were aware of that. There was very little, as I mentioned, um, the, um, little economic opportunity or academic education opportunity, little educational opportunity also economic but um they had like I said the public schools were horrible they were far away uh so i mean some people live close to them but they were few and far between you often had to walk miles to get to school and the reality was is that many uh boys had to quit early to help out on the farm to survive right so most ended up with a partial crappy education rather than a full crappy education um sons of wealthy planters had colleges and universities available to them um but this was really for the wealthiest the majority of the poor like I said Barely had any of that. The South had more than 500,000 white illiterate people. Um, men, boys, not just like women and then slaves. So, which is crazy to, to like at this day and age of this time period that you have that many. South had over 500,000 white male illiterate that because of this this education, they were forced to help out on the farm and they didn't uh, finish their schooling. This, of course, creates significant problems 
for moving up economically if you don't have the education to be able to do so. Plus, <clears throat> it you really had uh, no ability to, to, to gain larger farm or be able to, to move into the cotton um, market. Things that were available such as cotton gins or the economic market or crops and financial assistance were not available for the, the lower classes. This did, there was definitely resentment between the plantation elite and uh, poor white southerners. Um, <clears throat> for the, there it was. However, this is what's crazy with this is that the the plantation elite did a brilliant thing. Elite transferred this to slaves, and I'll explain what they did with this. Okay, this is the most brilliant, like tactical development to get them understood. Because here's the reality of this: white, even the poor white Southerners, got to vote and have a say in the government. And this could be extremely dangerous for the plantation elite because they were such a small percentage of the entire society. If the plantation poor white Southerners had banded together and voted for their interest, it would have undermined it and, and toppled potentially the, the plantation system and structure. Because the reality is, is that the poor white Southerners had more in common with how they were treated and their, their, their conditions and, and life with slaves than they did with the plantation elite. The only thing they had in common with the plantation elite was the color of their skin, the fact that they were white. Um, <clears throat> they were treated like crap by the plantation elite on a regular basis. They, they didn't have much education to schooling, if any. They, they were sustenance-based, often starving, didn't have enough clothes. Um, it, yes, not as bad as slaves, but they had, if you were looking at who you had more in common with, they had more in common with slaves than <clears throat> the elite. The only thing, as I mentioned, was color of skin. That they were white. The plantation owners used this to their advantage and said, look, right? You are white, which makes you superior. So therefore, this is the logic, white to superior to therefore, your interests are same as plantation elites. And, and, and put them into systems of overseers, put the men into overseer positions so they had power over slaves so that at least they could say at least i'm better than them i can control them i have the right to treat them like crap and they can't do anything about it the plantation elite had the right to treat them like crap the poor white southerners and they couldn't do anything about it but they sure as heck could do it to someone else Again, absolute power and the problems that it lies. But so this is the brilliant tactic is that they got them to consistently vote and support the policies that benefited the plantation elite and hurt them. Who were the ones that mostly had to go fight in the, in the Civil War? Not the plantation elite, not till near the end when things got desperate. And then some did. But there was exemptions for plantation owners that had so many slaves. The people who had to fight were the poor Southerners. And this eventually comes back to bite them in the butt because as the war continued on, they started going, why the hell are we fighting? We don't own slaves. What It wouldn't change us. It doesn't matter to us at all. Like as far as economically, if there wasn't slavery, because we don't have them anyway. But this takes a long time to get to that because the plantation elite had so crafted this narrative of bonding together and, and, and mutual interests so that they voted and supported that system and it reinforced that system of authority and hierarchy and power of, of white over black and, and free versus slave, even though condition-wise, the poor white Southerners were much more uh, 
in in their treatment conditions like the the slaves or the poor white uh not the poor the poor of uh, the free black population itself which is minor but that that would have been even a, maybe a closer narrative because those they're both free but but in limited capacity um <clears throat> that was just a, such a small group but that that they did they that they didn't look to their own interest because of racism because of the system of 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 reinforcing racism that it, you overlook your best interest um it was a hard life like i said because you had to basically try to survive on on, on basic sustenance you you did get treated crappily by the elite you didn't have an education opportunity women it was even worse women were expected <clears throat> let's see F. where are we F. women for women um they unlike the um, plantation wives there was no well, no leisure. They had to work in the fields. They had to cook and clean. They definitely raised the kids. They usually had to sew and make their own clothes. But the Southern society still reinforced ooh, submission to men. And so they were obligated to be demure and submissive to their husbands. So basically, life kind of sucked for them as well as we'll see for um, slaves they were free that was the difference and it was I mean that's a big difference they were still free but economically uh, politically socially they were on the lowest of low rungs they were seen I mean it was, it was they were looked at with disgust by the plantation elite Ugh, at least I'm not like that you know oh, can you imagine having to do that that was it was they were looked on with disgust by um, by the, the the main group that they that had convinced them to align with them, and so like and then there was no recognition for the fact that basically that their continued political, social, and cultural power rested on this group supporting them. Yeah, they got that, and then still continued to treat them like crap. But because of racism and the system of white is free and black is slave, um, and 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 also that not only that, but then slave as not human, in many ways that that. Uh, reinforce their connection to the um, to the plantation elite. Okay, our last the last thing is to look at slavery, the South. There were let's look, we'll look at the types of slavery first. The two main ones were field and house slave. And they had very, um, there were similarities and differences um, to each. Generally, the uh, field though was seen as um, harsher labor. And the house slave was seen as um, slightly easier. It wasn't, it wasn't as <clears throat> physically demanding all the time, but it wasn't necessarily easier. So we're going to look at those two. It was certainly, House Slave was seen as slightly higher in position. And technically, there were also like skilled jobs. Skilled slave labor. Um, but often it, it got connected to the House Slave. So if you were like a blacksmith or a horse trainer or valet or something like that some of those were skilled labor jobs a cook that technically were part of the house ones but those were even actually technically higher in the hierarchy than some of the basics house slave labor um but the, these these two kind of go together uh, in that process okay so 
with field labor. I'll just, we'll do this. So you were expected to work from sunrise to sunset. Uh, it was it was hard work. You had you worked under the overseer, and uh, the whip was the most common use of punishment. However, we're going to talk about um, punishment for women, men, and men were often different. Um, you had specific production levels and expectation, like. You they a lot of them would you'd measure how much cotton you picked, and then you'd have a quota. And if you picked more, your quota could go up. Um, and if you missed your quota, then you could be punished. So there was this 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 specific expectation that food um, was meager, often again dependent on the plantation. But if you're averaging it out, it was meager. Uh, lack of clothing. Um, you know, basic, basic necessities for survival, um, at the bare minimum. Uh, it was seen as hard work. It was backbreaking work. Um, and under constantly, you know, being, um, well, not monitor like we'll see the house slaves, but monitor in the sense of an expectation of producing work for that. Um, field work, so you, you lived on, you had slave quarters. Now, sometimes once the work was done, then they went back to the slave quarters and you did have some free time usually. And this is important. We'll see why when we talk about house slaves, because they often lacked this. The slave quarters after work provided some community. That was a, a big important component of having that community for support of, of family support of, or people taking in children to be part of their family if their parents were sold. Um, being able to, earlier before the slave laws got harsher because of fear of revolts and things like that, um, slaves had been able to like, you know, have their own little um, farm to produce more or to sell things or go do another job. All of that got extinguished. And as we get closer and closer to the Civil War, the laws got harsher. You had to have a pass to leave the plantation. Um, so you could not leave or go anywhere if you didn't have a pass. And there you you weren't before like you there were had been chances of people being able to purchase their freedom. Or family's freedom, again, being able to earn some money on their own to be able to buy other things that they needed or produce extra food. These things all go away. The laws get harsher. They have to work longer and harder. There's harsher punishments for um, disobedience of failing to produce. Um, so by the time we get close to the Civil War, uh, especially in the deeper South, conditions are pretty horrid. Um, because the laws have gotten worse and worse as they go because of this fear of, of revolts. And the reality is, is that slave revolts were almost non-existent. Um, we have Nat Turner's Rebellion and there was a, a few small revolts. Very small. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about it when we look at resistance here in a minute. Um, so it was, it was almost this... Uh, you know, fear that that wasn't something that happened... And unfortunately made life worse. Now the house uh, slaves, again, often were seen as easier work. But the problem was it wasn't easier because house slaves, essentially you were on 24 hours. Um, in the sense of as personal slaves often slept in their master's room. If you were a personal slave of one of the daughters of a plantation owner, you're expected to be there. So if she woke up and was hungry, you got her food. If she needed to get dressed, if she needed this or that, you were always there. If it was with a, for a baby, and, and many times personal slaves, they were, um, if it was for a girl, like you, you started when they were a baby. So there when... 
they were a baby and you were expected when she got married you had to go with her so you knew from the beginning if you were a personal slave of a girl you would be moving off that plantation so you were if you had family on that plantation you knew eventually you were going to be separated guaranteed now there was always that threat but here it was a guarantee that it was going to happen. You were had to be there twenty four seven on call if they needed something. So you, what this is, it lacked the community from slave quarters. True, they did often get, they did sometimes get better clothes and food because they wanted them to look nicer and you were you could get scraps of food or anything or and often were fed better from that you were less likely to be whipped but often um punished with other objects and always watched so you were more likely to also get and you know just because the owner was pissed off one day if you happened to be nearby you could get hit um so example less likely to be whipped it wasn't there were still there's others the cool mistress talks about the house the uh, plantation wife sending off uh house slaves that she got mad at to be whipped the the uh, plantation wives they sometimes did that but rarely Rather, they'd send them out to be punished by someone else. So it did happen. It was not like you didn't. Get, there wasn't that punishment. But what was more common is that that you would be around and the wife would get pissed off at something and she'd grab like a a, a paddle or a pan and and hit you with that. So you, you still got hit by things. You still got you got physically attacked. It just was different um, in 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 how it was. There wasn't the overseer walking around with the whip um and again we'll see men were more often punished with that than women women tended to be hit by other things and 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 also the the threat of sexual assault was used as punishment um but again you um the example of this would be harriet tubman harriet tubman was uh since sat down she was supposed to stand by the door um, and she had sat down at one point and they got mad at her and they actually slammed the door, her head in the door. Um, so that, that, you know, it wasn't like that you didn't, there wasn't physical violence towards house slaves. There was, it just was a, a different type often than, than the field. So in some ways house slaves were, well, they had a higher status because there was a status system within the slave community as well. Um, and we'll see with resistance, they had some benefits. Um, uh, many slaves learned to actually read and write because they had to sit there while the children that they were tending got an education. And then they could take that and go when they could go back to the slave quarters and they would teach them. Um, they often were able to have access to things that they could swipe and take from the home that they could give to the slave, um, uh, people in the slave quarters as well. So it did give them certain opportunities, but you also were always being watched by the the your the owners like within the the plantation working on the field while there was an overseer you couldn't be everywhere you had more time to yourself um or with a community of other slaves and that was vital to um creating agency creating your own identity creating um resistance and and so like i said both of these were very horrible situations but very it was different depending on 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 you know what your role was for women let's see what types of slavery so just put it here we'll say women versus men um and me actually we'll just do women here and then we'll, do, we'll talk about women from women it was uh you almost said it in some cases it was harder and why because um there was some things that men didn't have to deal with um that women did <clears throat> as slaves one was pregnancy 
Um, and you were expected to work right until birth. The, there was a huge problem with food. You rarely got extra food. But you need extra food when you're pregnant. And that uh, was difficult. And oftentimes, <clears throat> the, everyone would look out for each other. And those that were pregnant, others would give them small portions of their food. Um, again, in some cases, some plantation owners did give extra food to women who were pregnant, but that was rare. Um, so you were barely getting enough food as it was, and then you get pregnant and you need more and you don't have those calories that you need and you're still expected to work. You were expected to also go back to work. Uh, soon after pregnancy, soon a not pregnancy, soon after birth. Um, <clears throat> for many women, what that meant, of course, was that they, they, they strapped the baby to them while they worked. Um, however, um, well, we'll the, the issue, we'll talk about motherhood and, and, and with that, this could be used against them. Motherhood could be used against them in forms of punishment. Um, children were used as leverage and punishment. So there was one story of a woman who, um, she ends up getting punished and they say that she can't have her baby with her while she's working. Um, and, but she needs to feed the baby. So the baby had to like be, uh, placed over on a tree just near the field and she was working and then every couple hours she'd run over and feed him and then come back. Uh, and, uh, then this, in the story, this is, this is one of the slave narratives, um, she mentioned that when she ran over to get food, that there was a snake crawling up on the baby. It didn't bite the baby, but the, the baby could have died. Um, and she actually decides to run away soon after this. Um, and so children were used against them as punishment, threatened to sell. The other thing, of course, that you had to navigate is how to raise your kids. Um, with within this system of slavery. To, to teach them, you know, not only love, but the harsh realities of the world. Young kids, when, when they were little, until, uh, it depended, but, you know, somewhere between six and eight, would actually often play and run around with the master's children. And... Um, not really, you know, understand fully what's going on. And, and, and there was um, other stories with the slave narratives that one woman was talking about her daughter who was playing with the owner's child and trying to figure out how to teach her how to teach harsh realities of slavery while still um, teaching them their worth. Right, and, and, and the, the, the scene or, you know, run around and play, but then having, you know, one day all that ends, and then you have to go work in the fields. Or another case for uh, girls in the reality of, of sexual abuse. Uh, you know, it's almost dreaded if, if your, one of your kids was beautiful um, because um, they would be targeted. I mean, it didn't take anything. Anyone would be targeted, but especially those that were seen as attractive were uh, almost always targeted by the plantation owners. And knowing that this was a possibility for your children. And so the struggle of motherhood of trying to teach your child agency to teach them their value and their worth while still the realities of how you have to live within this system. This is how you survive. But you need to know that you're also this. Um, and that fell, that burden often fell on the mothers. Which, you know, in society that's, that's kind of how it was. More the mothers than the fathers. Motherhood also made it more difficult. 
harder to run away. Women were runaway slaves far less than men for several reasons. One of them was their children. Um, either they had young children and they weren't going to leave them behind, or even they had a, you know older children that they didn't want to leave behind. And running away with children, it makes it easier to get caught. So women, while they could run away, often either had to decide whether they took the children and risked it or left the children behind. And it, all of that was a heartbreaking decision. And in fact, for some women, uh, women and mothers... Um, you know, that the, they made the choice that, that their, you know, their children were better off not living within this world and the system of abuse. There was, um, there's one story of a, of a slave woman who, um, she tried to run away with her children and, um, they end up getting cornered and they, they're in a, a house and then they know that they're caught and she ends up killing her youngest or one of her daughters. And she doesn't, they, they, break in and, and stop her from killing the rest. And they asked her, you know, why she did that or why she killed that one, you know, first. And she said, well, because she, she, um, was a pretty, you knew that she was going to be targeted by the owner. Um, and, and that it was, you know, that it shows you there's another one of a woman who drowned her children in a well. Those stories certainly embody and exemplify the harsh reality of of how horrible slavery had to be to see that that decision was better for your children than growing up and living in that situation. And so to, to be a mother within that situation is just horrid in that sense. And then punishment is the last one with this. Okay, with punishment, women were often um, for punishment, well, they were whipped sometimes, um, more often than not. Um, oh, uh pregnancy I guess this one is this is punishment as well as just something you have to work on it's it could go any or not avoid not work on there's something that you had to like you know worry about um but of, of course rape which could be used as a punishment and or just was also they were targeted for that humiliation uh which tended to be sexual in nature they would be um stripped naked Uh, and and humiliated and shamed that way for punishment and of course the children were often used as threats for that as well um so well um they did have the other types of punishment as far as the physical as the whippings and beatings these additional things weren't used on men uh, very often um these were mostly things that women had to deal with their entire men of course had plenty of punishments that they had to to deal with and, and that were, were put upon them. Um, these were just additional ones that women had to navigate uh, as, as well. Um, withholding food. This was for, this could be for anyone. Food, however, if a woman was pregnant and they used that punishment, it was, far, it was even worse. And then of course, I mean, like there were the other punishments of beatings and, and, whip, and being whipped um, that took place. What's, but for men, um, what was it with, with punishment is that beatings and whippings were far harsher for men than they were for women. Women, they got them to, and they could be really harsh and brutal. But men tended to get the brunt of the physical. Also, there were other ones where it was, uh, there were stories of like someone getting an ear cut off or, or other mutilation. Um, also being put in these houses um, there were like sweat houses and they'd be chained up there. Um, and, and, and you just tortured in that sense. Those, while women could be put in those, it far more often was men that had to deal with that. So men got the brunt of, of the torture and, and harsher physical punishment. Women had the physical punishment, but then they all, but it was not usually as harsh. And they also, like, it's still bad. Okay. I don't want to... Uh, undermine that in any way it was still awful you just if you're looking at the intensity and extremeness of it men tended to have the harsher brutal punishment physical punishment women had physical but then they also had these psychological and then the sexual and rape and stuff like that 
that men didn't have. Um, so, so that based on gender, very much structured, um, punishments, um, that were, were doled out. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and we're, and we're, I know we're running over on time here is resistance. This should, I guess, be B here. Let's see. Okay, so with resistance, uh, again, um, I'll put we'll put that the slave revolts were almost non-existent, and why? Because if they failed. It equaled death and sometimes death for your family or other things that and, and so they knew that not only was going to end up with death and punishment for family and other slaves failure meant a huge price and of course not only that um, having the resources To be successful were almost impossible. To be able to get the weapons you needed, to be able to get enough people, uh, it it just isn't viable. Nat Nat Turner's rebellion showed that. Right, Nat Turner was uh, a preacher um who by all accounts uh his slave uh, the the slave his owner uh, treated him decent for a slave he was well fed well clothed had a lot of, quite a few freedoms compared to other slaves and so this 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 was meant to show and negate the argument that slave owners had that if you just treated them well that um you know they were happy and content this also is what uh, caused the Southern, um, the slaveholders to fear. This is exactly what they saw as the potential outcome and why um, law, certain laws were made harsher and increased. So that there's, there's an end result of slave revolts too. Laws for all slaves in certain states became harsher after Nat Turner's rebellion. Um, because it, it exemplified and embodied the fears that they had all the way back from Bacon's rebellion with indentured servants that this could happen again. Because the slaves outnumbered uh, white individuals in, in many areas. Nat Turner's rebellion, um, he, you know, preached and had gotten a lot of people. And they went from plantation to plantation and murdered um, the uh, the families and grabbed weapons and other stuff and actually had quite a group. Uh, even with that resistance, they still ended up not the, far being outnumbered when the militia and other army finally caught up to them, and it, it was a complete failure. They, I mean, they they certainly managed to kill several families and move on for a little bit, but there were it, long term it did nothing. Long term it did nothing. Those were um, hung um, and killed. Uh, and whipped and tortured before being killed and executed and and any of those connected to families often were then uh, seen as uh, perpetrators of this so rebellions are almost impossible to be successful and if you fail the consequences are very harsh so that just wasn't really what was the main resistance instead there were there were one was small things Come on, doesn't want to erase now. There we go. Small daily resistance, which could take place with um, breaking tools, slowing down the work, um, leaving the gate open. Teaching slaves to read and write. 
um, the slave songs, the songs, they had songs that, um, they would sing while working and some of them were very much directly, you know, not obvious, but targets at the system and the owners and things like that. Um, but there were, it was very common that if, if work was getting too, if they were pushing too much or just to do so to keep things, you know, mitigated from this constant expectation was you break tools or you, you would break the cotton gin of the machine and slow things down. Um, and you wouldn't do this all the time and it didn't happen all at once, but just small daily little things of resistance to show agency and that they still had control. Um, and in that way, in fact, you could argue that getting married was resistance. And here's the thing with this married and children. To the plantation owners, they often encouraged this because, of course, those would be more people that then would be slaves for them. Um, and, of course, marriage was not official in the uh, white law, but um, was that, you know, as they sometimes had when they had the marriage ceremony that it was until they were separated um, too far on a plantation versus the death to us part. Um, but for slaves, the importance of having marriage, getting married and having children, even if you knew that there was a risk that your kids could be sold off, that your husband could be sold off, that this could be used against you. And in many ways seemed like a system of control for the slave owners. It was a way of continuing to have normalcy and family and a life and saying that even in the face of this, we still can have this. Even in the, these horrible conditions, I'm still going to live my life. I'm still going to have kids. I'm still going to get married. I'm still going to do this. And by making those conscious decisions of these small things of choosing to do, it's saying, I'm going to live my life this way. And you, you know that, that, yes, there's a lot of control, but here are small ways I can have agency. So some of it's direct, like I said, attacks on the slave owner's stuff. Other times it was songs that were, you know, acts of defiance. And then some of it's just about being able to live your life in control in ways that you could. All of those are systems of resistance. Um, a bigger one, which, you know, most people were where was running away. Um, there were kind of, there were two types of running away. The first was alone. The other was with the Underground Railroad that took place. The Underground Railroad, so alone was riskier um, because you just, it, hopefully, you knew. there were some songs that talked about where you could go and that could help. But a lot of times if you were alone, it was riskier because you didn't really know where you were going. You didn't know who you could trust to help you. You didn't always know when you'd finally crossed over into the north. It was definitely harder, but though, especially I think the ones with the loan were more out of desperation um, than anything else. The Underground Railroad was a system of safe houses, essentially. System of routes and safe houses. And the goal was that they would get guided to the north. Now, with this, there were some, they were called conductors that guided them you, the underground road you could do this and sometimes you could do alone with the underground road if you knew where the system of safe houses where you could run away to one of the safe houses and then they could help guide you to the next one a conductor actually went and got people and then took them following this underground network harriet tubman is by far the most famous conductor Harry Tubman is was amazing as far as just how smart she was. She got the she got um, hundreds and hundreds of people to freedom, and she was incredibly smart about it. So she one she never took the same route uh, twice. Because one of the big downfalls that would get people caught is that your route would be discovered and the next time you took it, there'd be people waiting for you. Um, the, when she took people, you, you couldn't stop. People had to 
keep going, we'll say. Here's the story with this. Basically, the idea was if someone was sick or injured, you kept going. Because if you stopped and then got caught, you know, eventually it's kind of like eventually you'd give something away. Even if you didn't give anything away, where they found you would give something away. Um, there was once when one of the stories was that there was an older man that um, had hurt his ankle. And, um, you know, he said, I can't go. I can't go on. She said, no, you're coming. No, I can't. Just leave me here. And she supposedly, she had a gun. She supposedly, you know, tapped her gun and said, you're either coming or you're dead. And he, you know, he, oh, I guess I could come. And he made it. And um, she didn't, you were required to make it. There was an expectation that it was very clear. You either come or if you were so grievously injured that you can't, then, you know, she'll be putting you down in that sense as far as you're not going to be finishing. You're not going to be alive to be caught. Um, she took babies, she took families, she took older, um, individuals and she brought all of them over successfully. She had lots of disguises. Um, she dressed up as an old woman. She dressed up as a man. Um, she would, what she did is she, um, drugged the babies and so they basically slept the whole way because of course babies were probably one of the, the most dangerous for getting you caught when they cried or screamed. Um, there was one story where, um, she was in a disguise as a, as a slightly older woman, but potentially recognizable. And in fact, she had a wanted poster for the most money for her capture. So she was highly sought after, highly known, highly wanted in all of the South. And she actually saw one of her old owners nearby and she was worried that he was going to recognize her. So as he walked by, she turned to the chickens that were on the ground and just started talking to the chickens like a crazy old woman. And he just walked by and ignored her. Another time, they had been aware of, of, of her general location. And so they were they were chasing after her. Not like, you know, they can see her after, but they were closing in on where she was. So she decided to go deeper south because she figured that they would think that no one, no one's crazy enough to go deeper south. You always try to go north. And they did. They went north searching for her when she went south and then was free and clear to continue on how she wanted. So I mean, just fantastic with like, she had carts, wagons and horses that she, you know, had people in that taking in places. Uh, the stories, the disguises, her intelligence made her one of the most successful conductors. And, and, and then after the war, she was a huge advocate for uh, black rights and, and, and different issues with that and for women as well. So she played a huge role um, not only in her own escape, she was fully responsible for that, but then came back as the most successful conductor. So the Underground Railroad was the best system for that. It relied, again, on these routes, on these network of homes that were various, um, in the South, were various white uh, people's homes, usually Quakers, who had, some of them had tunnels or secret hiding places um, so that there was a quick exit or could hide if their house was searched. And the, they really went, the goal was to make it from house to house to house till you made it north. Um, and this system guided not just Harriet Tubman, but many conductors guided lots of people. Harriet Tubman is just the most well-known and, and did the most. But this was one of the best ways that slaves were able to escape, especially those that were, you know, if you were a single or at least going alone without kids and you were you were fit and, and, and knew your way, sure, you could have a good chance but it would still be really hard. Like, again, the best way to go was through the Underground Railroad um, and, and being able to have conductors that way. Or at least in groups with, with some knowledge of where you're going. The desperate ones that just ran often were caught because they didn't know exactly how to get to the north or where they needed to go or where was safe and where wasn't. You needed this network to help. But running away was the number one way of resistance uh, of leaving slavery. Um, where the day-to-day -day stuff was almost daily, and that was also a massive one. Uh, of course, some of the other, um, the rebellion we talked about, but was 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 rare. Um, and then, and then, certainly one form of resistance was killing yourself. Um, it's kind of that final act of resistance that didn't happen again often, uh, often either. Um, but we did see cases of mothers, uh, you know, killing themselves and their kids, or killing their kids as an act of defiance and resistance as well. So a ton of resistance and things took place within slavery, um, which undermined, of course, the Southern argument of this paternalism and this idea of, of that if you treat them well enough, they're happy. Um, like, like, cause they just, these were things that they didn't see a lot of time or they'd say, well, only a few run away. 
but the day-to-day -day resistance was often not realized um, because they did it in a way, of course, to not get in trouble, but still be able to slow production down or be able to take something or have some agency or learn something or, or share and get some extra food for that. All of that resistance was a way of pushing back against slavery in the process. Okay, we are definitely, I'm sure, way out of time here. So, um, we'll stop at that. Yeah, went way over, but I wanted to get all of this covered. Um, and we'll look at, um, the events leading up to, um, well, actually then we'll be looking at abolition and women's movement. And then the last events that, that kind of domino effect to, um, the civil war and, and the next lecture.